is impossible, it just hasn't happened yet. So we've had minimal sample sizes that we need to deal with, tissue viability, prioritising what we use the very tiny samples for, and how do we reduce those lengthy turnaround times so that one day we are able to do this in a clinically relevant time frame. So patient derived xenographs, uh, this is a, a, a lovely little uh, collection, thanks to Angela. And who's in the preclinical drug testing core. And I put this in just to, I guess, visually describe to you what a PDX is, a patient derived xenograft is, and what we do uh, to, ena to enable testing drugs in the models. So we have, because we have multiple different tumor types, as I was saying um, earlier, we have different methods for not just the culturing, but for the in vivo <coughs> models. And we want to be able to establish these directly from the patient tissue cells, the, patient, the, the primary patient biopsy, uh, but sometimes we need to culture them first to have enough cells to put into uh, a mouse model. And these have very uh, varied times to engraftment. Uh, the acute lymphoblastic leukaemia models are the most rapid and the most well established, and this is something that Richard has worked many years on. And then we're developing those methods as we go along, as I, as I mentioned earlier. But if we establish a xenograft, we can then expand it, which means we just need to have more mice. And we are able to then select the drugs that have been informed by either the molecular profiling or perhaps uh, in vitro screening, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and sometimes we might just select drugs empirically on the basis that we know that they have worked previously because we may not have any molecular indication for this. So there's a lot of information that goes into this and Loretta, who's sitting in the audience, uh, sits down with our preclinical drug testing core team and works very closely with them to design the drug efficacy experiments as to what drugs will be tested and how and when. Um, there are uh, quite a few challenges to consider when you're using mouse models and uh, that does include the fact that you need to be able to match the mouse and human drug systemic exposures which are quite different and uh, as I've mentioned we often are not able to do this in a clinically achievable time frame at the moment but we will get there. So in vitro high throughput laboratory drug screening uh, this is uh, effectively what it is, what I've just said, high throughput screening, we take um, 15, 36 well plates, we have the patient, the, the child's tumour cells, either <coughs> directly from the primary tissue or from the xenographs, and they are in each well, and we can then expose them to a large number of, of drugs or compounds that we call them, and we've got a 125 compound library that we will use routinely when we have the cells to be able to test. <coughs> And this will allow us to work towards generating a high quality in vitro drug response database. We do that by being able to uh, uh, look at, uh, so Chelsea Mayo, who is not in the audience today, but Chelsea has developed a pipeline to be able to call outliers. So what are the drug hits? What are these, what are the, what's the individual child's cells respond, tumour cells responding to and not responding to? And we can take those hits and uh, then curate them manually, which involves a lot of work in the literature, and then potentially take that back and see whether it links with the molecular profiling. Um, it can guide the PDX drug efficacy studies, and with sufficient evidence can be reported to the multidisciplinary tumour board. Um, I think I've probably covered all of that. Uh, but then the other thing uh, that is very, very important as we build this component of the program to be able to increase the number of recommendations we, know we make, we need to be able to understand how the omics will predict a drug response. And we also need to understand how to pinpoint that pathway of activation and link it back to observed omic alterations. We also need to understand when we get a drug hit or a drug response, what is it that we haven't seen in the molecular <coughs> profiling that we need to look for and be able to link? And so this comes back to Ellie. 
Now, uh, I'm just going to use this as an example. Ellie was such an urgent case that we did not do this real time. But following on from that, uh, we were able to, and this is actually work from Paul Eckert, who is now the, the group leader of our translational tumour biology team, and his PhD students seem to be postdoc Lauren Brown while they were at the Murdoch uh, in Melbourne. And uh, they were able to do functional characterisation and validation, so biological testing of the fusion by engineering the fusion and expressing it in cell lines to show activation or inhibition. And you can see, I think the important thing here is that if you have SEC1 NTRAC with larotrectinib, you see a response. With imatinib, as, as a, uh, an alternative, you see, no, you see almost no response, and of course this is the control up top here. And so we were able to show biologically that the NTRAC fusion would, uh, there would be a response. So I think that's pretty exciting. Any questions? Yep. Just coming back to sort of the analogy of the head up cancers, a lot of these mutations in the, in the, in the pediatric case are general, but do you have any sense for what the clonal or subclonal diversity might be? Are there additional sort of mutations on top of the general at lower frequencies? And how does that impact on the pediatric? In the germline itself, mm -hmm. or? Or the cells that end up better in a PDX model, of course. Right, so tumour heterogeneity, clonality, um, that is a great question, and I will be going into that. <laughs> um, so that comes back to the field's moving so fast, what do we do to keep up? And how do we constantly improve what we're doing so that we stay ahead of the curve and so that we continue to uh, really enhance the, the, the platform itself and again, increase the recommendations that we can make and improve the robustness of the recommendations that you can make. So, importantly, this is all about collaboration and open, transparent communication and collaboration. So, within Children's Cancer Institute, um, we have recently established a translational tumour biology group Child Cancer Computational Biology Group. We had an existing bioinformatic, uh, very an existing talented bioinformatics team, and we have established a joint paediatric immuno-oncology program with, with the Peter Mac. And these all feed into and overlap with Zero Childhood Cancer. It is seamlessly integrated, and we work with each other every day. But on top of that, again at the institute, we have. Um, four other things, and we work together with them. There are no boundaries, it's all about collaboration and it's all about being able to harness the expertise of the people around us to be able to grow on what we have now. And beyond the four walls of, this, of CCI, of Children's Cancer Institute, we have all of the hospitals, we have the Kids Cancer Centre, and we have 21 collaborating research institutes around the world. And the only way to overcome the challenges that we have is to do it together, globally. So, a couple of uh, areas that we are working on in, in terms of this is the next phase of precision medicine, how do we take it to the next level, is uh, the immuno paediatric immuno-oncology program that we have established with the Peter Mac. And we have um, people working on it at, at Children's Cancer Institute and at the Peter Mac, and we want to be able to understand the immune landscape of paediatric cancer because at the moment we don't understand that well. And until we understand the immune landscape, we can't use it to predict responses or to predict what kind of therapy would work best for them. Are they good candidates for immune-based uh, uh, immune based therapies or are they not? So we want to understand the immune landscape and then we want to be able to design immunoprofiling uh, panels, whether it be through IHC or some other technology, uh, to be able to make and identify, sorry, to be able to identify any potential responders to these therapies. 
and immunotherapies that you will have heard of quite frequently are CAR-T. There are RNA editing based therapies as well that are, are becoming uh, more well known now in terms of development. And we want to be able to incorporate all of this into our reporting system, testing and reporting. The other area which is because the next phase or the next step of <coughs> precision medicine is liquid biopsies. This comes back to um, tumour heterogeneity and clonality and, and identifying disease before you can see it um, by normal or by standard means. And understanding that we can detect <coughs> C CTDNA, which is circulating, tumor DNA, cir circulating cell free tumour DNA and or circulating tumour cells in plasma is really, um, I guess, a, a changing the way we look at things. Because up until now, we've really only had one time point from the patient's biopsy, and we've not been able to look at it over time. And this is a technique that would allow us to do that, uh, particularly uh, for children where invasive surgery is obviously something that we want to be able to um, avoid. So intratumoral heterogeneity and the emergence of minor subclones that can subsequently determine either responsiveness or resistant to targeted therapeutics, therapeutic agents can um, really can't be effectively characterised, monitored or exploited without this. So um, some of you may know that circulating tumour cells were actually discovered by an Australian pathologist, John Ashworth, in 1869. They've long been thought to be the mechanism of cancer metastasis. Um, however, it's only recently that we've been able to harness our innovative technologies uh, with microfluidics, cell enrichment and isolation, molecular analysis and importantly computational capabilities that um, it's now feasible to harness them to study, study the biology of cancer and responses to therapy. So um, this will really accelerate and expand the clinical utility of liquid biopsies to great potential to improve patient health outcomes for all cancer patients, not just children. There's been uh, quite a bit of success, uh, early success in some adult cancers, and we want to be able to see if we can actually replicate this and improve it in the paediatric cancers. Uh, and there's, there will be a lot of work done on this. We will be looking extensively at mapping the tumour heterogeneity. We'll be looking at clonal evolution. What are the aggressive clones that are really driving either um, uh, resistance or relapse? And how do we use that information to treat earlier with uh, the right combination of therapies? So, how do we bridge the gap? How do we integrate all of this into clinical care? Maybe not so easy. Healthcare systems uh, are extremely complex. There are a lot of interconnections, a lot of activities, um, both in real time and over time, that alter the context of everything that we're doing. And so the outcomes and behaviours of both of those um, directly involved in the healthcare system and of others, really important. And uh, this is um, a, a concept of health implementation science that is led by Geoffrey Braithwaite at Macquarie University and the Australian Institute of Health Innovation. So we recognise that it's extremely important that we don't just stop at the bench. We must be, we must be looking at how do we actually implement the research? How do we take it from our research environment into a standard clinical care, into the health system? Now, there's a real tension right now between research and the delivery of clinical care because the lines are blurred. They're almost non-existent now. We use research uh, data, we use research results to actually inform how patients are treated. Particularly in the paediatric oncology environment, uh, the standard of care almost for the majority of children is that they're on a clinical trial of some kind. 
And so we need to be able to better understand how we do this and, and how we manage the tensions that we have. How do you implement something that will continue to evolve? Um, precision medicine will evolve for many, many years to come. How do we actually do that? Uh, how do we implement that while it's changing? How do we define efficacy in an environment where the horse is really bolted on genomics? Um, you know, we, we're not in a controlled environment to be able to do this. And how do we find, how do we actually define what's, what is effective? We are creating new workforces. There are, there are people in this room who have skill sets that are being applied at a clinical level that have never been before. We have clinical biomaticians, genomicists, molecular oncologists, genetic counselling, and then we need to be able to do all of this in a sustainable long-term manner. That means influencing at a policy level for funding, and for actual integration in the health system. How do you change the health system to, to actually uh, cope with a new model of care? So we're conducting uh, health implementation science uh, research projects, and I can see Jim's in the room here today. Hi, Jim. And uh, this has been done with uh, Jeffrey Braithwaite's group at Macquarie University. And we want to be able to activate the program's implementation activities with this project uh, and understand the roles of the crucial players involved in the program. Where are we at? Who's doing what? And uh, how's the work actually being done? Is it how we imagine it or not? And then we want to be able to assess <coughs> all, the level, all the clinical levels and the scientific aspects of the program. What's working? What isn't? What are the opportunities to improve over time? Following on from that, or I guess complementary to that, is socioeconomics and health economics. Um, what's the impact, and both the economic and social impact of caring for families affected by childhood cancer? We don't know what it costs to, for, to care for a child with cancer right now. So we're going to collect the first robust data on the cost of aggressive or high risk children in Australia, uh, we'll estimate social and economic impacts and we'll evaluate the cost effectiveness of precision <coughs> medicine. So uh, how much more effective is it to use precision medicine to, if, within the model of care for these children? And then <coughs> we want to be able to influence policy by providing the data. We need to provide the evidence to say that this is actually effective, not just from an improved outcome perspective for the children, but for the health system as a whole. And just a couple of examples, this is really early data thanks to um, Loretta, clinical team at the Kids Cancer Centre, and we have some very, very early data on 21 patients who've received recommend, the recommended therapy. So this is a therapy that was recommended by the multidisciplinary tumour board and their responses. And you can see and, and remember that these are children with very aggressive uh, cancers, they're very ill, and they have very poor uh, prognosis, very poor pro uh, prospects. And you can see that uh, at, at the moment, just over 50%, and, and I want to be clear that there could be some bias in this because this is a very, very early data and a very small number of children. But we are seeing um, either a stable disease, a partial response, or complete response in some of these children. Uh, this is one example, an 11-year-old boy who had an aggressive high-grade brain tumour. Uh, with molecular profiling, there was a targetable abnormality. The drug that this uh, target would respond to is available in Australia and has a paediatric dose. Now this is very important when it comes to implementation and sustainability. We need to have a paediatric dose and it needs to be available in Australia. And this is one of the biggest challenges that we face. Um, the uh, drug was funded by the hospital and you can see in the images that the child has had a partial response. And then the second example is a 16 year old girl who had a relapsed pancreatic tumour requiring removal of her pancreas. She had no response to any conventional chemotherapy and the molecular profiling showed very high expre expression of a gene that was targetable with a drug. 
uh, the drug is available, the hospital funded it. Now, importantly, while it's on the PBS, it's not subsidised for this type of tumour, tumour, and that's another challenge that we need to address. And she's had an almost complete response after two months. So, uh, finally, uh, there are numerous people to thank for the Zero Title Cancer Program. This is just a core list of people. If I added up how many people are involved in this program across, across the country, or even in the city, is well over 100. And we all work together to achieve this. Um, it doesn't just take a village, it takes a whole world to be able to do what we are attempting to do. And I think that's one of the key messages that we need to take home, is that we need to do this together. We need to do it openly, transparently, and collaboratively um, to really solve the problem that we have and eliminate children dying from cancer. So thank you. Thank you, Ness. That was fantastic. Now I'm opening.